שלום חברים וחברות, כבר אלפיים שנה עם ישראל היו אומרים ובני ירושלים עיר הקודש במהרה בימינו אמן. For some 2,000 years now, whenever, wherever the diaspora carried them, the Jewish nation held this prayer firmly in their hearts. And the holy city Jerusalem will be built with utmost speed and haste in our days. Amen. In June of 1967, that prayer became a reality when for the first time, the two sectors of Jerusalem became one. No longer with the barriers and the barbed wire symbols of hatred separate this holy city that plays such prominence in the Muslim, Christian, and Judaic religions. My name is Jeff Grunfeld, and as chairman of the Speakers Program, I am delighted to introduce to you today the man who exercised the major role in the reunification of Jerusalem, Mayor Teddy Kolek. Well, thank you for coming here. Um, forgive me also this very formal appearance. I come from the opening of uh, the Jerusalem Fair here in Los Angeles, which uh, I hope will be a tremendous success in which many people in Los Angeles and the people at the consulate and everywhere invested a great deal of uh, labor. I just quickly walked through it. Um, some of the dolls are not yet properly dressed, but I am told that by this evening everything will be shipshape. Well, I don't know how much you know about Jerusalem, and uh, I prefer, with the exception of a very few minutes of a very short introduction, uh, for you to ask questions so that I don't talk about things that may not interest you. You know, of course, that Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities. It's 4,000 years old. Uh, many of the problems of town planning and of uh, uh, restoration and others go back to some of these very old things. But the main thing is that today, this is the only city where Jews and Arabs live together and live together comparatively peacefully. It's the capital of Israel. It was divided for 19 years, as our chairman said, by barbed wire where the troops stood in 48. It is now united. It will remain united forever. But, <laughs> but at the same time, I hope that within Jerusalem will set a sample of an example of tolerance and of possibility for everybody to live together. If I say this, I am not only concerned with Jews and Arabs and Christians. We have the greatest mixture of Jews that uh, anybody can imagine. And there is an oversimplification of saying just Oriental Jews or Ashkenazi and Western Jews. If you take, let's say, Ashkenazi Jews, the difference between somebody who may come from here and from this country or this city and has lived here all his life, young or short, and somebody who comes from, let's say, Latin America, or somebody who has come from behind the Iron Curtain and has lived all his life in a regimented society, even if he was opposed to it, but this is the way of life he has lived, their differences, their cultural makeup, their background is very different, and to bring them together is not easy. As it is not easy to bring together people who are extremely religious and people who live a freer and more Western style of life. Of all of them, we have many in Jerusalem and greater contrasts than anywhere else. We are a city that has absorbed more immigrants than any other city in Israel, by numbers and by percentages. We have, because of the great number of Oriental Jews that are living in uh, Jerusalem, mainly refugees from Arab countries, about two-thirds of the Jews altogether that are there, and because of the religious people who live there, much 
a much higher birth rate than the rest, double of the rest of the country. We have four times more families with five children and above without taking into account the Arabs yet, and therefore a great number of social problems which we haven't solved. Problems of housing, problems of education, problems of social care. We are a poor city. We have added to this since five years about 60,000 Muslims and 15,000 Christians. They are not united groups either. If you take the Christians there, they live not far from each other in Christian quarters. It is not like a Catholic and like a Presbyterian or a Methodist living here. Each one of them has at the same time a different nationality and a different language. An Armenian is not only an Armenian Christian. He has his language, he has his alphabet, he has his patriarch, he has his church, he has his traditions. And the same is true of Greeks and Copts and many uh, and Abyssinians and and many of the others who live there. And the Arabs are uh, not a very unified group either. So all this together means that we are the most mixed city that exists anywhere. Mixed cities and immigrant cities all over the world, between Belfast and Cape Town, between uh, uh, the great cities of this country, and between little cities in Belgium like Louvain, are not always the happiest cities. They have uh, great problems. They come in waves. Sometimes they die down. Sometimes they come up again. But they are, there are serious problems in mixed cities. As I can therefore tell you with pleasure and with pride that so far it is going well in Jerusalem. And people, while they have different aspirations, and Arabs certainly have different aspirations than the Israelis in Jerusalem, are trying to work this out in a democratic way and by discussion and not by violence. But nobody can be certain that this will always remain so. Somebody gave me not so long ago uh, a book uh, by young Winston Churchill, the grandson, who wrote a paperback uh, immediately after the Six-Day War, and there he wrote, well, there is great tension here, and at the moment, but there have been other places where there has been great tension, and after a while it has subsided and there is peace now, and why in a few years' time shouldn't there Jerusalem and Israel be just as peaceful as now, in 1967, Ireland is today. Now, in Ireland things have changed, and nobody can guarantee that if we shall not foresee the problems and will not tackle them in time, similar trouble may not arise there. Nothing is ever, can ever be taken for granted. But we are trying to tackle the problems, we are trying to create equality uh, in the city. We are today still the largest immigrant city. Today it's Jews from Russia mainly, and some from Latin America who are coming, and only a few from the Arab countries. And we are trying to build and preserve, to preserve and build the beauty of Jerusalem, and in spite of its quick growth, to preserve its character, which also is a very complicated and difficult and sometimes expensive business. Well, this as an introduction, if you have questions, I'll be very happy to reply to them. We have standing microphones at either end if you want to address questions. Uh, yes. In the last four years, we've heard nothing but kind words from the Israeli government uh, as, as to the uh, efforts of the Nixon administration. I'm wondering if, as a spokesman for the Israeli government, if perhaps you'd like to say something uh, uh, about the administration, which is more interested in the welfare of the Midwestern farm corporations than the welfare of the Soviet Jews. As we know, all, this, all the reports show that, the, that substantially uh, that the conditions of Soviet Jews have, subs have substantially worsened, that uh, the Nixon administration supports policies of the Rogers Plan, the Scranton Commission reports. I can't hear you. That I you can't hear speak me. A little, I can hear you, but I can't speak a little slower. Do you mind? Yes. I'm saying that I'm wondering if you could speak out, perhaps, as the first Israeli official against the Nixon administration, which consistently has uh, been uh, anti-Israeli 
and uh, has not worked in the interest of, uh, as, I, as I referred to, for example, the Soviet Jews, whose uh, condition has substantially worsened since the time that he went there campaigning for the American Midwestern farmers, where he supports the Rogers Plan, the Scranton Commission reports, up until about a year ago refused to release the Phantom Jets uh, as su very suspiciously, suspiciously at the same time that uh, Ambassador Rabin came out endorsing the president and uh, other consistent uh, things such as that. I I'm wondering if perhaps you'd like to say something about uh, the wonderful things that President Nixon has done for Israel. Well, I have a clear division between the Foreign Office of Israel and between myself. Um, they don't interfere in garbage collection, I don't interfere in foreign affairs. But each one of us thinks, each one of us thinks that the other is doing a lousy job. Uh, sir, I was wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a little more on the friction between the Sephardic factions and the which I know to have been existed for a long time. And what is the situation? Uh, I, I, I recall the situation in Haifa where there was a, a the Sephardic uh, uh, people felt oppressed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, start burning cars. There were riots, etc. Has the situation in Israel between the Sephardics and the Ashkenazi improved a little bit, or to what extent has it improved? May I say that I don't think that the, that the question is correctly put. There is a very old established Sephardi uh, element in Israel. Uh, if you would have come there 150 years ago, there were only Sephardi Jews in mainly Jerusalem and Safed and maybe Tiberias. And uh, there were no Ashkenazis there. They came only during the 19th century and then in great waves during the 20th century. Uh, the problem is uh, one of the recent Oriental immigrants, those that have come since 1948, they have come without means and without skills very often that are, were usable under the conditions. They are today uh, the majority in the country, a small majority in the country. They have come from countries like from Morocco in the west to Kurdistan and Afghanistan in the east and from Syria and uh, Turkey in the north to Yemen in the south. Uh, in Jerusalem itself, these Oriental Jews, uh, and I don't include in them the Sephardim who used to live in Jerusalem since many generations, have come, are today the majority. They are 60%, 65% or 66% of the children in grade A as they get into school are children of Sephardi, of those Oriental families. And when we finish university at this moment, I hope when those that enter now uh, school will get to university, it will be already considerably different. It has gone down from 66% to 6%. Um, and uh, the reasons uh, are many, and uh, they may be known to you. I mentioned before that uh, all of the Sephardim have la most of them, most of these Oriental families have large families, five children, six children. I know many families of 12 and 14 children. Housing is inadequate. There are when three children sleep in a bed and go next morning to school and are tired, and even the house, the environment is such that you don't have a book and that the parents anyway don't know the language well and they haven't been able to help the children in school, and you have a certain number of dropouts and all this, you have serious problems. I believe that the situation has vastly improved over the last five or six or seven years. 
it is very very difficult still and the problem is the greatest problem that we are facing we have in Jerusalem the numbers may seem small to you but if you look at every individual case it is a difficult case we have at least 400 young couples of people who have come back from the army where you have who have we, we, have, we have many more of, of others, of, more of less complicated ones, but those are the extremest cases. For the people married with children, back from the army, who, have, who live with their parents, with sometimes their grandparents, in the most crowded uh, conditions. And about 3,000 young couples altogether whom we haven't yet provided with housing. But we are an immigrant country. People are coming in in great numbers. And uh, we, have, we have a war at our hands, uh, even if it is a comparatively quiet war now that absorbs a lot of uh, our substance and a lot of the money and a lot of the aid that we get from outside, whether it's uh, from governments or from private individuals. So uh, I cannot tell you anything else. These are, this is not a problem. This sounds very soothing. I don't want to sound soothing. This is a problem that will take at least another generation to be solved. Indifference of what happened in, I think, 52 or 53, uh, the, uh, 20 years ago, when you spoke, uh, uh, the uh, incident you spoke of in Haifa, I believe that uh, the vast majority of these Oriental Jews today uh, see the progress themselves and are working at it themselves to make it an even greater progress. For the first time since a few years, we have <coughs> parent-teachers uh, groups together with them. They are interested in the education. We have built better schools. We have built kindergartens down to the age of three now in order to absorb them, in order to make up for what the home cannot always give them. So I believe that uh, we'll solve the problem. But uh, you cannot have us, I started out by describing the different cultural backgrounds in Jerusalem. You can't solve this kind of a thing by decree or by uh, one, uh, one particular act. It takes a long time to do it. You have examples here um, in this country where similar problems are even further away from a solution than we are. I'd like to know what concrete proposals have been brought up or what plans there are from the government of the city of Jerusalem to incorporate the Arab leadership of the old city of Jerusalem and East Jerusalem toward a common government to govern both parts of the cities and what, what percentage of representation will go to these Arab government leaders. This is a very complicated question. You can... Uh, I believe uh, uh, the, the one basic problem is, the first of all, that Arabs do not believe in democracy. The things they believe in are dignity and justice. Those are the things that move them. The word democracy doesn't exist in their vocabulary. And they are not particularly interested in participating in democratic governments. To the extent they have an assemblance of democratic governments in any Arab country, they are void of any content, and you know that as well as I. This is one basic difficulty. The other basic difficulty is that any Arab who would today join the city government would be ostracized not in Israel and not in Jerusalem, but in the Arab countries around. And this would worry him very much because of the following reason. He might very well want to send his son to an Arab university in Beirut or in Alexandria or in Amman. Uh, he uh, may be a partner in a business in Kuwait or in Abu Dhabi or in some other country, uh, some other Arab country. He has relatives over there who may be molested or he may be fear that he would be molested. And he can achieve what he wants today to achieve, the preservation of Arab character of the city, not by official participation in an Arab government, but by the private contacts he has with us every day. I'll give you an example. We have uh, 15,000 Arab youngsters in schools uh, in uh, East Jerusalem. 
they go to sc Arabic schools and not, uh, uh, I mean, they go to municipal schools. The language of, in, of instruction is Arabic. The curriculum is different. Uh, their teachers are exclusively Arabs, maybe with the exception of an individual physics or mathematics teacher here or there who may be a Jew from Iraq, but 99.9% uh, .9 of the teachers are um, Arabs, their own old teachers. Now, uh, as the number of school children grows and as the number of children in high youngsters in high school grows, there's a great demand for Arab universities. And they want to go to Arab universities and not to the Hebrew university. They feel they would like to have their own. We are encouraging them to build their own university on the West Bank or in East Jerusalem, but so far they haven't done so. While during the 20 years of uh, Jordanian rule, they wanted a university and they were unable to, do, to get it from Jordan in Jerusalem and now they feel somehow frustrated and they have they are complicated by the fact that they would feel now under Israel they are building an Arab University and Israel is allowing them to do what the Arab government had did not allow them to do so they don't know how to go about it but we want to enable the youngsters who finish high school to go to an Arab university, but we think that by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the period when the people are entering high school now, uh, they will finish. Many of them might want to go to Hebrew universities even if they don't want to do so, to do so today. So you need an entirely different curriculum in order to finish school in such a way that they can go, that they can answer the demands of either university, one of the seven uh, institutions in Israel or one of the many Arab universities. So we asked a group of uh, Arab educators to sit down together with us and develop a uh, curriculum that would satisfy them and we did. It was completed sometime in April and we started it in uh, September. This is the new curriculum. They did so under one condition. We could announce the fact that such a committee exists but we could not announce the names of those who participated in it. To give you the complication, the Arab chairman of this committee, we had two, Arab chairman of this committee, an outstanding educator, has a brother who happens to be a commander of the Syrian terrorist organization. Now, in what position would he put his brother if his name would appear suddenly in the papers? So you cannot expect Arabs officially to participate in the near future in city government. But uh, we do have them participating in the committees. We do have regular consultations. They have re reached the highest ranks of appointed officials. And uh, I do not believe that this is a grievance that you would hear from Arabs in Jerusalem. Um, what is the situation in the controversy over Mamzerut and also over autopsy today in Israel. And also over? Autopsy. Well, basically the argument, of course, is a very simple one. Basically it uh, is an argument that uh, we live in a modern society and uh, that uh, the, the rabbinate has to find solutions to living in a modern society. Uh, here we have a problem of uh, Russian Jews uh, coming in, many from mixed marriages. Here we have a great number of people who come uh, from this country, uh, mixed marriages, who were married uh, by uh, conservative or reform rabbis who are not recognized by the rabbinate in uh, Israel and therefore their marriages are not recognized and therefore their children uh, will uh, not be uh, eligible to marry under normal circumstances and there are many other such problems. Uh, we are all hopeful that uh, the young and vigorous and intelligent chief rabbis that were elected recently a month ago will uh, bring about not a change of the halakha or the change of the religious rules but will find the proper interpretations within that uh, within those religious rules that will make modern life uh, 
acceptable to them. And it is sometimes very difficult. Religious rule, for instance, enabled uh, people to milk a cow on a Saturday, although you are not working. Modern uh, life is such that a cement factory or a steel factory cannot be interrupted, uh, interrupt its process of production on a Saturday. So you can find in uh, similar attitudes of uh, the ancients, if you want to, a way of interpretation that will make life in a modern society acceptable. I hope that will come about. I know we have uh, a, a strong opposition uh, to this. This opposition uh, is genuine. But it has also the advantage of knowing uh, that there is somebody to do the work for the on Shabbat. I have city councillors who can close their telephone on Shabbat and not do anything on Shabbat because they know that my telephone is open and if a water main bursts, somebody will find me and I'll do something about it. I, would do, I wish uh, what they would do, I wish to know what they would do if, uh, or what would happen to the city and, what, and they haven't given an answer to that, what would happen if there wouldn't be such people who are willing to answer an emergency call on a Saturday. Uh, Mr. Mayor, in the uh, past year, we have seen uh, that El Fatah, or Black September, whatever the difference is, has seen fit to uh, express themselves by gunning down innocent athletes. We've seen that President Sadat has not yet recanted Egypt's stated objective of destroying Israel. And in short, the situation still seems as tense, and the Arabs still seem to desire Israel's destruction as much as they did in 67. And I'm wondering whether uh, you envision any breakthroughs in the coming year, and if so, whether you could speculate on what area might be the first area to thaw and the first area that would change the Arab attitude and possibly bring about peace. I think uh, that uh, terrorism is a terrible thing, but it is uh, a sign of frustration and failure and not a sign of success. They have failed in raising any uh, revolt amongst Arabs in Israel or in occupied territories. Um, let me elaborate on this for a moment. I believe there is sympathy for terrorism in Arab, uh, let's say, amongst Arabs in Jerusalem. Uh, the psychology is, 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 is difficult to understand, but I think I can explain it in a few sentences. Arabs in Jerusalem are nationalist Arabs. They uh, have uh, great advantages today, they have great disadvantages today. The advantages, is, the advantages are economic progress, freedom of speech, safety, physical safety for their leadership that doesn't exist in other Arab countries, uh, out of which they hope uh, a new leadership will grow. The disadvantage is that they don't decide on their own fate, but other people decide on their own fate, and it is a severe disadvantage. It is a mistake to believe that uh, economic uh, well-being makes up for national aspirations. Their major purpose today in life is to preserve the Arab character of their part of Jerusalem. They can only do so if they are there. While the city was divided and their part was entirely Arabic, they didn't mind if people emigrated. So there were less Arabs there, but it was still 100% Arabic. Now Arabs leaving weakens their uh, situation. Arabs will stay only there if there is a good economic situation. Good economic situation is parallel to good tourism because their economy is to a very great extent based on tourism. Tourism and terrorism don't go together. So therefore, they, from their own purpose, are interested in, a ter in, in preventing terrorist acts in East Jerusalem. And they're doing everything they can to do it. 
It's also, it's an honest theory. It happens also to be a comfortable theory for them. Mayor Khan. And therefore, uh, I'm, uh, forgive me for another And therefore, you have no support of terrorism in, uh, in, uh, West, uh, in East Jerusalem or on the West Bank for similar, for similar reasons. But that doesn't mean that they have given up their nationalist aspirations. We will have to find answers to that, and I hope we shall be able to find them. Mayor Kalak, I have two questions. Uh, one, what does Israel offer a young person today from the United States who might be thinking of settling there, for example, a college student? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages as opposed to remaining in the United States and finding a fulfilled life? And two, in view of the fact that the flu season might soon be upon us, uh, would you have the recipe for gold of my ears chicken soup? Well, in answer to the second question, as far as I know, she excels particularly in making coffee late at night. <laughs> the, um, well, I don't know whether you need me to tell you the advantages of settling in Israel. There are no economic advantages. There are no advantages of comfort. Um, There is, with all the fact that we exist already for 25 years as a state, and maybe for a few decades longer, there is a young country which still has to be formed, a society which still has to be formed. Um, it's uh, a society basically with all the fact that uh, of in Jerusalem, the paradox that on the day Jerusalem was united, it stopped being a 100% Jewish city and became a mixed city on that day. With all this, it is a country of the Jews who are trying uh, to find a new way of life. One cannot find an entirely new way of life. Today, the world is one, and uh, the differences are not great, as great as they were before. But if, uh, for instance, in Jerusalem, we should find the recipe, uh, not of the melting pot, but of the mosaic, where Jews of different uh, background can preserve a great deal of their heritage and be proud of it, uh, not necessarily all be formed in uh, the image of Jews who came from Poland 30 years ago. If uh, Jews uh, will, will uh, achieve that, if we shall build a city in which uh, all the others will be not on, while they will not decide the fate of the city, the fate of the city will be decided by the Jewish majority, but where the others will eventually have a full way of life and where we will establish tolerance and uh, uh, symbiosis of various people living, if we can do that and by this give an example to other troubled cities all over the world, and young people who come there will want to be partners in this and in many other things which all are not comfortable and all are difficult and all are sometimes uh, look very exciting from the distance but the hard work when you get there then you have something to look forward to but uh, don't believe in slogans understand that it's hard but it's worthwhile Mayor Kolek um, it is well known that the elections are just about to come about and that uh, Golda Meir is, um, is not, not thinking of running and that the three people that are vying for the job is Moshe Dayan, Yitzhak Alon, and... Uh, well, Yigal Alon. Yeah, Yigal Alon, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, let me see. Sapir. 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 Yeah, Yitzha yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Could, um, what is the feeling of the people in the country, and especially yours? And will this have any, um, will this make any change in the policies of Israel in general? Well, I believe uh, that uh, Mrs. Mayer may possibly reconsider and serve for another year or two. If she won't, I think uh, as the polls show, 
the vast majority of people uh, believe in the Yan. I'm not so certain that this is a uh, hundred percent as the polls show because the polls show him today as a Minister of Defense and as a Minister of Defense he has the unlimited uh, admiration and confidence of everybody um, and it is difficult for people to see him in a different role but I still believe if the majority shouldn't be as vast as it is in his present support, there would still be a great majority for him as well as Prime Minister. Uh, with all this, the process of electing Prime Ministers is a rather complicated one, and it is as the process of electing uh, uh, presidents in this country is a very complicated one. I see in the papers these days, people speak about uh, uh, primaries in the whole country for one president or something of the kind. Um, I wish you would have that. Maybe we would have uh, a better way of selecting a prime minister. Um, anyway, I think we still have uh, some time left. But uh, on, the po on popularity grounds, there is no question that uh, the majority would be for the young. Sir, uh, as an Afro-American, I see in America and throughout the third world, that being people of color in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, a split or a chasm developing between the third world and the Jewish people, primarily because of two reasons. Number one, the elimination of the right of self-determination to the Palestinian people, and number two, the, the alliances, the economic ties develop with Israel and the United States. Now, in regards to number two, in terms of the alliances developed between the United States and Israel, I would like to ask why, how can you, how can Israel develop that type of alliance when historically the United States has always been and has always advocated an anti-Semitic position when they develop a quota system for the Jewish immigrants leaving Hitler's Germany who could not come to the United States when the United States did not intervene when nine million Jews were wiped out. Second, in, a, in regards to the first question, could you articulate the rationalization in terms of the elimination and the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. Well, uh, I do not think that we uh, deny the Palestinian people uh, the right to self-determination. The majority in the Hashemite Kingdom are Palestinians. They have uh, the full right to determine whatever they like. They can, call, they can call themselves tomorrow the Palestinians instead of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, they, uh, I believe that uh, eventually, uh, personally I believe that eventually a great part of the uh, Palestinians who live today uh, in, uh, under Israel rule on the West Bank will uh, be part of some kind of an Arab uh, government and will uh, determine their fate as well. Uh, so far, the Palestinians have not uh, developed uh, any democratic process of their own. Uh, if at all, uh, they are being torn between a variety of things. Uh, they uh, do not like particularly King Hussein because many Palestinians were killed by him. They are afraid and fear and would not like at all the terrorists. I think, in fact, they hate them, but they don't dare to say so because they are the only expression of some pride they can take sometimes. Somebody told me that in this, uh, in California, uh, there are quite a number of Chinese, and uh, these Chinese uh, are all good Americans, and they were all for Taiwan and against uh, uh, mainland China at the time of the uh, uh, Korean War. But when for a short period during the Korean War, the Chinese armies were winning, the Chinese were very happy about this here, although it went against America, just because for once it proved that the yellow people could beat the white people. You have a similar feeling there. And with regard to, with regard to, their, their, to, to, to terrorists. Although they don't like them, they want for once to feel that an Arab can beat uh, an Israeli. 
So uh, the psychological situation is very complicated. They haven't developed any ideas for themselves yet. What you're talking about are a few slogans of a few people and not the will of the, Palestine, uh, of the Palestinians. I believe the will of the Palestinians will be expressing itself more and more in Israel because this is the only place where they can speak out freely without being afraid of anybody. And democracy will have to develop itself in Arab society as it has never done before. Yeah. Just one more question. Okay, I actually have two questions. They're both concerning the issue of Arabs in Jerusalem. One is, do the Arabs now, or do you intend to allow them within the next five or six years to have voting rights in national elections? And two, what do you intend to do with the status of the uh, Mosque of Omar or the Haram al-Sharif? Well, the Arabs in uh, Jerusalem are Jordanian citizens. They are Jordanian citizens by right. They have the right to become Israeli citizens if they want to. They would regard coming, becoming Israeli citizens today as deserting their own ranks. So very few have become Israel citizens. All those who become Israel citizens can vote for parliament, for the Knesset. All the others can only vote for the municipal council. You wouldn't allow in any country somebody who is a citizen of a foreign country, in this case a hostile country, to decide to vote for the body that decides on war and peace and national policies. And therefore the Arabs in Jerusalem cannot decide on national policies. Number one. Number two, according to Jewish tradition, the Haram al-Sharif is the temple, uh, according to history, it's a temple mount, but according to Jewish tradition, you cannot build the third temple there before the Messiah will come. The Arabs are afraid that we might tear down the mosques and uh, build uh, the temple. Now, according to our tradition, this temple is already built. It's waiting up there somewhere and will come down in its apportioned place on the day the Messiah will come. That risk the Arabs have to take. So many, so many unexpected things have happened in our time. This may happen too. Who knows? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for receiving me so nicely. I was told I would have a lot of hecklers here, but they didn't show up. I'm sorry. I would have enjoyed myself more.